Hello everybody and welcome back to tomorrow news. We've got a ton of Starship updates to get through, some Falcon 9 and Dragon news and some Moon news and we've got some launches so stay tuned as this is your episode of tomorrow news for the week of September 23rd 2021. Starting up on board the International Space Station, Crew 2 astronaut Tamar Pesquet has taken this photograph of the two Dragon vehicles docked to the US Harmony module. Now seeing these Dragon capsules docked at the same time is super cool, but what's happening down in Texas is arguably a lot more exciting. Some new aero covers have turned up at the production site which are the sheets of metal which cover over the mechanism used to actuate the flaps. Booster 5 stacking has also been getting underway with it looking just around one quarter completed on the outside. Raptor work has been happening underneath Booster 4. This engine, Raptor Center 67, has been removed and it has been replaced by Raptor Center number 64. Makazilla is well under construction at this point with the large parts of the chopsticks, the arms that will catch Super Heavy and the carriage, the part that will slide up and down the integration tower being spotted at the construction facility. A new ship nose cone currently expected to be for ship 21 has been seen through the door of one of the production tents. The interesting point with this one being that it follows the old design but it has been manufactured with the mounting points needed to attach heat shield tiles. You can also see here that the nose cone has been readied for those tiles to be installed. Speaking of heat shield tiles it's pretty much fully checked over on ship 20. I can't spot any markings so even if there are there aren't that many to go as the orbital flight test looms on the horizon. Some nice and fresh liquid nitrogen has been delivered to the orbital tank farm, something that the tanks will definitely enjoy drinking up. And finally this week with Starship, the news isn't coming from Starbase at all. It's coming from McGregor. Located halfway between Dallas and Austin in Texas, it's most famous for being SpaceX's Merlin engine testing facility and also where they test out some first stage boosters from time to time. It was also the location where the company first tested launching and landing a rocket booster with the Grasshopper and Falcon 9R programs. The current process when SpaceX wishes to create a Raptor engine is the creation of the engine in Hawthorne, California, it then being driven to McGregor for testing and then it being driven down to Starbase for integration with whatever vehicle it's designed for. However, with the construction of a new facility, the first step in that process could be omitted entirely. A new production facility has been announced which will be dedicated to manufacturing the next generation Raptor 2 engines. And as you might imagine, SpaceX will be needing a lot of them, meaning that this rocket engine factory will soon become the fastest in the world. A new Raptor test stand has also been built, allowing the engines to be tested vertically instead of just horizontally. The current trend seems to be the RVAX being tested horizontally and the other variant being tested vertically. And don't worry, this doesn't mean anything bad for the Falcon 9 or Falcon Heavy as their test stands are completely safe and secure as long as the vehicles keep flying, which it looks like they will for a very long time as the new contract from the Ministry of Transport and Infrastructure of Turkey has just been announced for the launch of Turksat 6A. And to wrap it up this week with SpaceX, Dr. Cyan Proctor of Inspiration4 has released this video showcasing the first opening of the docking hatch revealing the cupola and the earth below. It really is magnificent. We've got some moon news for the first time in a while and it's to do with NASA. The organization's Volatiles Investigating Polar Exploration Rover, or VIPER, which is a very cool backronym, has been chosen to land near the western edge of Nobel Crater at the lunar south pole. The location is one of the 15 originally thought up locations but it was chosen as it has good visibility of the earth for direct communications, good illumination for the solar panels, the terrain doesn't feature that many steep drops which would be difficult for the rover to navigate around and it quote maximizes science return and flexibility to help ensure mission success once Viper is on the moon. The launch of Viper is scheduled for 2023, but with spaceflight it's very important you have everything ready, certainly with those missions to other celestial bodies. Bringing it a bit closer to home, there has only been one launch this week, but it is an exciting one as it went to a space station and we had an arrival back on Earth with humans inside. The three crew members of Shenzhou 12, Ni Haisheng, Liu Boming and Tang Hongbo touched down in the Gobi Desert around 0430 on September 17th, ending their three month stay on the Tian core module of the Tiangong 3 space station. With the main parachute deployment occurring at 10 kilometers above the ground and the heat shield falling off 
at five and a half, the capsule touched down within the expected area disclosed in the airspace closure notices issued earlier in the week. A few days later, on September 20th at 0710 UTC, this landing was followed by the launch of Tianzhou 3 atop this Long March 7, lifting off from LC201 at the Wenchang Satellite Launch Center on Hainan Island, the second ever cargo resupply mission to Tiangong 3, and the fourth out of 11 launches needed to build the station, this Tianzhou spacecraft is holding cargo for use on the upcoming Shenzhou 13 crewed mission, including a new 90 kg spacesuit designed for EVAs. Docking to the core module just under seven hours later at 1408 UTC the same day, it now seems pretty much everything is set for the next three Taikonauts to head into space. Coming up over the next few days, there's an Atlas V in the 401 configuration, a Long March 3BE, Zhilin 102V atop a Koyao Zhao 1A, Yaogan 3202 atop a Long March 2C, and Zhilin 102F atop another Koyao Zhao 1A. And here is your space weather with Dr. Tamitha Scove. Space weather this week continues to keep us very interested. As we take a look at our front side sun, look at that big region in the south. This is region 2871, and it's been firing off a bunch of solar storms, some of them almost Earth-directed, but not quite. On top of that, we've been seeing a lot of other filament eruptions in the south, and those have been nearly Earth-directed. We might even get one of them graze us here in the next few days, but it'll just be pretty minor. But that's not even the whole story. We also have region 20. 2872, 2873, and then look at all these little regions beginning to pop out. We got 28, possibly 74, 75, 76. Oh my goodness, we can't even keep up with all the numbers that are of, of sunspots that have been coming out on the Earth facing disk. We have already boosted that solar flux up into the low 80s, and it could easily boost up into the mid to high 80s within the next couple days. So, this is good news for amateur radio operators who need that solar flux to be boosted. Believe it or not, though, that's that's not the only story either, because we have this massive coronal hole that's going to be rotating into the Earth strike zone here in the next couple days. It will be sending us some fast solar wind. So even though we had a solar storm just this past week, we could easily get yet another one here in the next couple days. Now, as we take a look at our far-sighted monitor, this is Stereo A, and it's looking at the sun just a little bit from the side. You can see region 2871 as it fires off that gorgeous solar storm on the 17th, and then early in the 18th, you can see even another solar storm lift up in the north. Now that one is not Earth directed, neither of these are really. But look at all the active regions that just begin to gurgle up to the surface. Oh my goodness, we're going to have a gorgeous show here in the next probably week to two weeks of all of these active regions. And you can tell because you can see the band in the north and in the south, this means solar cycle 25 has fully taken hold, at least on this side of the sun. So. Uh, expect a potential for M-class flares, and this could affect space traffic um, for any types of radio comms here in the next, well, maybe two weeks. So we're going to be paying attention to that very carefully. And also, we could have more threat for some decent solar storms. For more details on this week's space weather, including when and where you can see aurora, and how those bright active regions might affect you, Come check out my channel or see me at spaceweatherwoman.com. Before this episode ends, let's give a thanks to all of our citizens of tomorrow. They contribute financially every month and get access to some of our perks, including access to scripts and the Escape Velocity Discord channel. If you want to join the Escape Velocity Orbital, Suborbital, or Ground Support citizens, head on over to youtube.com forward slash tlmonro forward slash join, or just click the join button next to the subscribe button below. Sharing the show around also helps us a great deal, so if you feel like doing it, I'd recommend you do. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next week and goodbye.